My name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is October 6th, 2022, and I call this meeting to order. Um, just off the bat, uh, the staff has recommended a denial for social equity status for one of our applicants. Um, so we're gonna have to do an executive session to hear about the issue and the rationale for the recommendation. Um, we're going to do that at approximately 1.45 after Bryn has reviewed um, the, all of the staff recommendations and before we vote on them. Um, it's very exciting to see the opening of retail cannabis in Vermont um, and really to have it happen with such a sense of community. Um, thanks to everyone who made this moment so successful. Um, as regulators, our biggest concerns are around public safety, consumer safety, and ensuring an adequate supply chain. Um, we didn't see any issues with respect to public safety or consumer safety. And um, when it comes to the supply chain, um, I know that the kind of diversity of products and cultivars um, was limited, um, but the supply held. Um, you know, of course, our early focus on getting outdoor cultivators licensed means that more product hey. is in hey. process and hey. on the way. Um, this week, our applications up for approval um, contain a number of new product manufacturers. And in fact, um, it looks like we have applications at all five of our license types, cultivation, testing, wholesale, manufacturing, and retail. Um, so there's a lot to look forward to as this market starts to take shape um, and innovate. Um, Julia or Kyle, would you like to maybe reflect on some of your early impressions? Go ahead, Julie. Uh, sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, Saturday was a really big day. <laughs> um, I personally visited two of the open retail shops on Saturday and one on Monday. And, you know, as you were saying, Chair Pepper, while I was waiting in line, I had an opportunity to reflect on just how much has been accomplished by our brave little team in this last 18 months. Um, you know, we early on acknowledged that equity would be the thread that stitches together good policy and business practices and staying true to that, we charted a path for a sustainable market that prioritizes uh, inclusivity in its framework. And I could see that, um, you know, in, in the businesses that opened. Um, it, as we've all said several times in the last week, but probably worth saying again, getting to this point wasn't easy. And there were lots of sleepless nights. And I just want to echo my appreciation again for the tireless dedication of our staff, most of whom uh, hit the ground running so fast that they were flying. So from my bottom of my heart, thank you all for that hard work. Um, and then we had some partner agencies in our advisory committee that worked with us and collaborated with us. All of those folks had full plates before they were collaborating with the board. And so the time that they've spent um, is also much appreciated. And then I think, you know, this industry could not have taken off without capable entrepreneurs who had some serious hustle. And I could see that as well um, this past weekend. So, you know, cannabis industry, you now have a thriving industry and a business community in its own right. And I'm looking forward to watching that continue to grow. Um, much more to come. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can phrase my thoughts any better than, than Julie just did. I visited to of our retail shops on Saturday as well. It was really cool and exciting to see just how happy everybody was. And there were so many different walks of life in line with me. And I waited in line just like everybody else for an hour and a half at one shop and for 20, 30 minutes at another shop. And the excitement was palpable. Um, it was very exciting. And you know, as Julie alluded to, I've kind of been thinking about this as, you know, the board itself has kind of been training for a marathon the last 18 months. Um, we didn't finish the marathon. We started it on Saturday. And so we're running it now and a lot more work to do. I think obviously some folks have concern about pricing or whatever the case may be. I think it's really exciting that some of our small cultivators are actually starting to see a return on their investment and, and getting that money flowing back to them and all the hard work and hustle that they've done. I think as our supply demand looks at looks more like what we think it will be, um, you know, prices will will stabilize and look like other markets. But you know, opening day, it's hard to expect much else with with limited supply and um, over demand. Um, but as alluded to, nobody ran out 
completely out of anything. I know that some some things did run out, but hey, you know, I think if um, we're talking about minor compliance issues and, and not um, product safety, consumer safety issues, about a week after opening, I think you know th this this is a a win for Vermont at least as it looks right now, and that's that's a credit to everybody listening, everybody here, and and everybody who's helped get us to this point over the last better part of a decade, if not more. So that's all I got. Great. Thanks for that. Um, turning to just a few other more administrative issues. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are waiting for their license. Um, just a reminder that the board will not approve your license until your operation is essentially turnkey. Um, the consequence of the board issuing a license is that you can begin to operate immediately. Um, we are the last stop on the train before your business can possess cannabis or cannabis products on site, or you can open your doors to the public. Um, this means that we will not approve an applicant whose location is under construction or the safe hasn't been installed yet or your security measures aren't operational. One area where we've been seeing some delays um, is in obtaining certificates of occupancy. Um, it's my understanding that fire safety has met their target um, of moving 95% of their applicants through the pipeline within 30 days. So very grateful to Landon and the team over there um, for the work they're doing to help move our projects. Where we are seeing some delays is in towns that have uh, municipal inspection agreements with fire safety. Um, these towns require additional coordination with local inspectors. Um, of course, anytime you involve more people and more coordination, the timeline um, to approval can be extended. Currently, there's 10 towns in Vermont that operate um, under a municipal inspection agreement. These are Barrie, Bennington, Brattleboro, Burlington, Hartford, Montpelier, Putney, South Burlington, St. Albans, and Winooski. Um, every prospective applicant should get in touch with fire safety as soon as possible, um, but that is doubly true if you plan on operating in one of these towns. Um, there's more information about these municipal inspection agreements, including the contact information of the local inspectors for each of these towns, um, and that's available at the fire safety website. Um, when it comes to product registration, just a reminder that um, the form to register all products and the payment portal is live on our website at ccb.vermont.gov forward slash forms. Um, this is a key component of our consumer safety mandate. Um, and uh, you can upload all the information about your product, including the labeling, the packaging, and the test results. Um, this only has to happen once per product type and can happen um, by any licensee. Um, but really, um, generally speaking, it's going to be the responsibility of the licensee that's putting their name on the product to get that product registered. And when it comes to flour, we need a registration for each uh, individual cultivar. If you have any questions about product registration, feel free to email us at ccb.products at vermont.gov. Other than that, um, just need to approve the minutes from our meeting on September 28th. Um, I guess I had a chance to look at those. Yep. Yep. All right. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, motion to approve the minutes. Second. All right. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Um, next on the agenda is a review of the inventory tracking forms. Um, you know, we did a little bit of this last week uh, with Kerry. Um, he has further refined them and put together some guidance. Um, it's my understanding that we're going to send an email out um, next week to our licensees for their first report. Um, and it's going to be using the forms that are available on our website and the guidance will kind of help prompt you as to how to complete the form accurately. But Carrie's going to come back uh, one more time today to kind of review any of the updates and hopefully clarify some of what we're looking for.
Thank you, Pepper. You, you may have to keep time on me here. Um, I will put together sort of a guidance document, if you will, for the forms. Um, last week we previewed what those forms look like. Um, getting to this meeting is a heavy lift. Um, so after this meeting, Nellie and I will work together and have those forms posted online so folks can preview them. But I wanted to go over some specific terms um, to help facilitate folks fill out those forms. And can you see my screen? Yes. All right, well, we'll walk through. Um, so inventory tracking guidance, um, since the primary prim since primarily our license holders at this point are cultivators. Um, cultivator is on top, and this is where the sort of terms we introduced a few weeks ago are going to really, really matter. Um, harvest lot. Um, when we talked about what testing needed to occur, we introduced the term harvest lot. And, and here's sort of our working definition of harvest lot. Um, cannabis grown in the same manner, same fertilizer schedule, same pesticide application schedule, and on the same flowering schedule. A harvest lot can contain one or multiple cultivars of cannabis. Each harvest lot will need to be tested for pesticides and pathogens. <clears throat> depending on, unless it's all going for extract, sorry, I'll, I'll uh, amend that sentence. Um, a grower decides how many harvest lots they have, depending on what works best for their individual business practice. And when you see our reporting form, the harvest lot is basically the key to us tracking your <clears throat> flower or canvas as it moves through the process. In harvest lot, um, in later iterations of our software, this number could be um, assigned by the database itself. But for right now, when you're looking at the form, the harvest lot is your license number and then a sequential number. And in this case, it's 001 would be the first harvest lot for a cultivator. <clears throat> and then to continue to track as that harvest lot gets broken up and sold to different uh, retailers or offered for extraction or <laughs> discarded as waste. Um, each, of those, each of those process lots will have their own numbering sequence. And again, it's just the harvest lot number with, a number se with another <clears throat> sequential number after it. So you're your process lot equals the harvest lot number with another sequential number after it just for tracking purpose purposes and again this can be system generated once we launch our salesforce system but currently in the forms we're going to ask you to put that in yourself and once it's in it's locked on it's locked with that process lot and to further sort of refine the definition of process lots process lots of smokable flour will need to be tested for thc potency and pathogen testing um, the moisture analysis that we've asked for is generally part of this testing because the labs need to dry that product uh, in order to test it and for smokable flour offered for retail your potency level uh, is 30 percent and <clears throat> some uh, a topic that's come up as we move flour to market is uh, aspergillus positive cannabis can't enter the smokable flour market, but can be offered for extraction. <clears throat> and sorry, I didn't read the definition of process lot, but process lots are whole or partial harvest lots that follow different paths toward market or diverted into waste. And we do have a few manufacturers um, currently licensed and the tracking, these will be separate forms and hopefully um, folks will be able to <coughs> intuit sort of what form they need to fill out. But manufacturing 
manufacturer tracking <laughs> um, for concentrates. All concentrates must be tested for potency. Concentrates being sold that are not decarboxylated must also be tested for pathogens. <laughs> um, THCA and THC are required, and the other cannabinoids are optional depending on what's guaranteed on the product label. <clears throat> And uh, solvent extracts or extracts further processed with solvent must also be tested for residual solvents. So you're getting layers of um, inventory tracking and testing guidance in this document, but um, manufacturers who, so manufacturers who commingle product will also have uh, develop a manufacturer lot number um, and a manufacturer lot is a single lot of extract produced um, either by solvent or mechanical extraction and can be a combination of one or multiple process lots from one or multiple cultivators <clears throat> the manufacturer lot number mirrors the a harvest lot number in that it's just your manufacturer license number followed by a sequential number. The manufacturer lot number is traceable back to all harvest lots that went into that manufacturer lot. <laughs> and to mirror the cultivation once it makes it to a manufacturer, um, we have manufacturer process lots and some people have been sort of referring to those as batches so in your head this is sort of a batch where manufacturer process lots are whole or partial manufacturer lots that follow different paths to market or go to different manufacturers to produce different products and the manufacturer process lot number is just uh, just like the cultivation um, harvest lot process number in that we've added a number another sequence on it. Um, once extracted or infused manufacturer process lot number must trace with the product being offered for retail sale. So those the products, the gummies or other edibles um, made from an extract either at that specific manufacturer or a different manufacturer that um, bought extract to must sort of, the product must have that manufacturer number in its, on its label somewhere. Um, other forms we have for inventory tracking include the transfer of cannabis form. Um, transfers will be reported by all license type when cannabis or cannabis products change owners. So um, as we said last week when we were introducing inventory tracking, what we're tracking is whenever chan cannabis change changes form or hands, or based by hands I mean owner. And there are there's a form to track those transfers that uh, will also be posted and we'll be tracking by process lot or manufacturer process lot or registered product. And basically what the form is going to ask for you, the amount that was transferred, the date it was transferred, um, who it's being transferred from and who it's being transferred to. Um, manufacturers will be required to report what's coming into their facility and from which license as well as what was manufactured in number of registered products, um, either weight, number of registered product or weight of extract. And this can be done when the products or are produced or, or it can be reconciled every two weeks. Um, we did hear comments last week about, uh, especially for cultivators, um, tracking when when it's done but we we did have a discussion about that and i think we're going to prompt you even if nothing's changed with your um harvest lot to come in and touch base with us every two weeks at least until we get uh, our salesforce uh, solution up and running and salesforce is just the name of the database that we're using um 
and I know this is going to cause some heartburn, but uh, retail reporting during our interim reporting period, and we are set to have our Salesforce uh, system up and running um, by the end of the year. But until then, uh, retailers are going to struggle a little bit um, because during the interim reporting period, retailers report aggregate sales of each product sold in a two week period. Um, transfer reports will reconcile inventory still on site. And this can be done <clears throat> at any time during the reporting period, as long as the same two week reporting period is identified. The interim reporting forms can only facilitate 10 products at a time, so multiple reports will probably be necessary for our retailers. Um, and the interim solution will not facilitate a direct connection with your point of sale software. Um, the CCB in partnership with the Agency of D Digital Services hope to move forward with a system that will have the ability to integrate with point of sale tracking software. But at this time, those services aren't available. So you're, we are I, all going to struggle here together. Um, one in receiving and reviewing that data, and the other is the amount of work it's going to take for folks to report it. And um, the bullet I don't have on here is wholesale, but wholesale will will have a reporting form and it will be the sim very similar to the retail uh, reporting form in that you'll be tracking what you got, when you got it, and who you got it from. And when it leaves the system, who it went to, what it was, and what date that was. Um, so that very similar to the retail for or, uh, the manufacturing form for wholesale. And there's also a loss of cannabis form loss of cannabis report form and all licensees uh, will report any loss of material or product on the loss form and this form captures losses of plant material or product um, plant material by weight and product and product by number of products lost um, please use their form to report any loss including samples sent to laboratories samples sent to prospective retailers, wholesalers or manufacturers, or loss from contamination or adulteration in any um, tracked waste. And that that's our, like I said, it's a living document, but that's the guidance that we're offering. Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're going to require um, reporting um, at regular intervals starting, you know, I think next week is when we'll send out uh, an email to our licensees about uh, reporting their inventory. And um, I'm sure there will be additional questions. We'll have information in that email that goes out about how to get your questions answered. And, um, and again, this is kind of a stopgap solution until we have a more permanent um, system in place. Um, which I think is November, um, you know, I forget the exact date, but uh, it's being built current as we speak. Julia or Kyle, any questions about that? Nope, thank you, Carrie. No, nope, thanks, Carrie. All right, um, Bryn, um, why don't I turn things over to you for um, recommendations on social equity and license licensure? Okay, sounds good. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so Kyle has graciously um, agreed to project your register for this week so I don't have to um, share a screen remotely, which might not go well. Um, so here you have um, your weekly adult use and medical cannabis register. Um, we start, as always, with the medical cannabis program. Um, so you can see that it's been a really quite a busy week for our medical staff. Um, they've issued 130 patient cards uh, from between September 28th and um, October 5th. And we've received 145 renewal applications 
um, and nearly 60 new patient applications. So quite um, quite a busy week uh, for the medical program. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that you can see there that, that medical staff are processing applications um, received on or after September 7th. So we are now, we have worked through the backlog and we are now um, processing applications within that 30 day uh, required timeline. So that is great news. So I will move on now to the adult use license application data. So here are your numbers of um, the application statuses for all of the um, applications in the queue. Um, as the chair mentioned, this week you do have quite the assortment of applicants that are up for board approval. I think the only license type that is not on the list for um, for board review is a mixed cultivation license. We've got an indoor and an outdoor, and we've got four manufacturers on the list, um, testing lab, several wholesalers, and a retailer. So it's a it's a great week for um, for our for our staff. Um, the numbers I wanted to point out are down along the bottom. If you look at the total numbers. Um, under submitted and received and under review, which are kind of the early stages of the application process, the numbers are really quite small. Um, we're, we're the most popular status this week is our incomplete status. We've got 185 applicant applicants in incomplete status. Um, the bulk of those applications, as you can see on the very top uh, row, are employee ID card applicants. So we've got 112 employee ID card applicants that are in incomplete status. Um, and as a reminder for everybody, what incomplete status signifies is that um, our staff have received your application and reviewed it, and they have sent out um, to the applicant a list of things that are required um, for them to finish up their application. So they've identified all of the things that are missing or deficient in the application, and they've notified the applicant of what they need to do um, to finish up. So um, it signals like the, the numbers in the incomplete status signal like a really huge amount of work on behalf of the licensing staff. Um, so I wanted to point that out to everybody. Um, I think that was all I wanted to point out. Oh, there's one other thing, sorry. Um, if you look at the row for retailers, you can see um, that we've got 20 in incomplete status and 15 in resubmitted, resubmitted status. So you've got 35 retailers that are uh, in the queue and on their way to the board for approval. So quite a quite a number of retailers that are in process. I think that was the only thing I wanted to point out. You do have a testing lab up for uh, approval this week and one more that's in the queue. So we can move on unless there are questions. <clears throat> okay, so I'll go over the list of um, applicants that staff are recommending the board approve for a license. So as is true every week, this list of applicants um, have been reviewed by our staff and um, have been found to meet the requirements for a cannabis establishment license that are set out in board rule and also in statute. Um, so the list this week includes uh, only in VT LLC applying for an outdoor tier one cultivation license. Apex Arboretum applying for an indoor tier one cultivation license. Lindy's Kitchen applying for a tier two manufacturing license. Apex Arboretum also applying for a wholesaler license. Big Intelligence Group applying for a wholesaler license. Vermont Cannabis Distributors applying for a wholesaler license, the Cannabis Collective applying for a Tier 2 manufacturing license, Northern Craft Cannabis applying for a wholesaler license, Glow Canna applying for a manufacturer Tier 2 license, Apex Arboretum again applying for a retail license, Steep Hill, Vermont Labs, applying for a testing lab license, altitude drops, tier two manufacturing license, and lastly, passion fruit farms, applying for an indoor tier one cultivation license. 
So that is your list of applicants that staff are recommending that the board approve for licensure this week. All right, and social equity. So our, we just have our license amendment numbers there. You can see we've got six license amendments that we've issued so far and six that have been dismissed. Um, that's just a status update for some of the other work that the um, licensing team is doing. And then we've got our social equity applications um, submission status there. So um, we've got 16 and incomplete, eight and resubmitted, three pending board review, and then you can see the numbers for um, that have that have been through the process and that are approved or issued. Total of 112 right now. And again, the reminder for the board about these numbers is that these numbers reflect everybody who has applied for social equity status. Um, so anybody who submitted their application and indicated that they were a social equity applicant are reflected in these numbers. If you scroll down to the next table, um, that identifies all of the applicants that um, have not yet had their status determined. So we've got 10 people in the queue um, who've identified themselves as social equity applicants, but um, have not reached um, the phase of, of board approval of their status. So um, we have three applicants up for social equity status approval this week. Um, we've got submission number 1165, Submission number 1155 and submission number 1203. Um, the first one meets the criteria for a social equity individual applicant, as that term is defined in board rule. And the second two meet the criteria for social equity business applicant, as defined in board rule. We did so, not get there um, the detail. Yeah. And then if you scroll down to the next page, we've got two um, applicants that our um, staff is recommending the, that the board deny social equity status for these two applicants. That is submission number 1301 and submission number 1172. Um, and as the chair mentioned, the, one of these applicants, um, the staff is recommending a denial of social equity status for this applicant, and we should probably discuss um, the, the circumstances of that applicant um, in executive session. Okay, well, why don't we um, go ahead and do that now. Um, any um, sense of how long, Bryn, this uh, executive session might last? I'd give this one, um, I'm gonna guess, That 10 minutes. Um, okay. Why don't we do uh, no more than 10 minutes? Um, yeah, uh, so no, we got you. We got you back. So okay. you think about 10 minutes. All right. Um, is there a motion to enter into executive session? I move that CCB go into <clears throat> executive session to consider confidential attorney client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the body and that executive session is required because premature general public knowledge regarding such communications would clearly place the board at a substantial disadvantage. I further move that the board invites Susanna Davis, executive director of racial equity for the state and Jay Green, racial equity research and policy analyst from that department um, into accession, executive session with us. Great, is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Okay, so Nellie, um, if you wouldn't mind putting up the OA message, just indicating we'll be back at 1.45. We're back. Um, and James Pepper, Chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is October 6, 2022. It is 151. Um, we're ex we've exited executive session. Um, no decisions were made in executive session. Um, what we did there is there was a staff recommendation to deny social equity status. Um, the applicant had applied as being from a community that has been historically um, uh, disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. Um, we try we heard the staff recommendation. Um, as to what that community was, um, whether it was sufficiently defined 
and whether that community had been disproportionately harmed by cannabis prohibition. It was more than just the kind of general threat of suspicion or prosecution that all uh, communities that are even tangentially associated with cannabis experience. Um, and I think we are now ready to vote on all of the recommendations that the staff provided to us today. I move that the board accept each of the recommendations for social equity status and licensing approval as presented to us by staff in this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, the last thing on our agenda today is public comment. Um, if you join by the link and would like to make a public comment, please raise your virtual hand and we'll try and call on people in the order that you raise your hand and then we'll move to folks that join by a phone. Dave is first. Hey, um, so uh, first, thank you to uh, Julie and Kyle for coming by Flora uh, over the weekend. It was great to see you and uh, you're, you and the rest of the team are always welcome. Uh, second, uh, shout out to all the great cultivators who've been filling our shelves. Um, we'd love to hear from more, uh, reach out anytime. Uh, my comment for the board relates to the inventory tracking, the interim system. Um, I'm concerned with um, just how error prone this is going to be. Uh, we have a um, very sophisticated tracking system uh, employed at our store. Uh, we are using Dutchie. They are uh, you know, very popular in the industry nationwide. We can generate for you pretty much any report that you could ask for. We could do same day, next day for you for any period of time in any product or product category, or even customer by customer, if you wanted to have that. Um, to have to export our data onto a spreadsheet and then upload it manually, line by line, into a Microsoft form that's limited to 10 products per form, um, it's not just that it's time consuming, there's gonna be errors. Um, errors that are really unnecessary, if I could just give you a CSV file, uh, an actual export of the information that you need. Um, so I'm asking slash begging for you to consider uh, a process by which people who are using a sophisticated inventory tracking system can give you guys reports upon request rather than this kludgy system of typing in, you know, data into a Microsoft form. Um, but uh, I'll leave it at that. And I thank you all for your hard work. Thanks, Dave. Wrong. Ron W. Hi, this is actually Zachary Tyson. I'm watching with my team. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, like I said, my name is Zachary Tyson and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mr. Z Craft Cannabis. Um, we're a social equity business that received our approval for social equity status in May. We are a black owned business and majority black invested. We submitted all of our materials, including the certificate of occupancy from DFS, the final requirement to date. After fulfilling these requirements, we hope that we'd be in the queue as you've promised priority review for applicants like us. We are incredibly concerned as to why we have not been awarded our license and have had little communication from the CCB as to why. Thanks, Zachary. Rose. Hello, uh, thank you for listening. This is Riley Amorosa, also known as Rose. Um, something I wanted to bring up in regards to pesticide testing is um, it was mentioned earlier and it's something that I've been uh, thinking about and a little concerned about is the fact that um, you can do pesticide testing on your entire harvest instead of plant by plant. If you know anything about uh, growing plants, each plant uh, will have a different um, need. Some pesticides are, are very dangerous, and that's why we're doing these testing. But again, some plants don't require those pesticides. So there's some, you're going to have people 
picking and choosing individual plant products that they want tested that they won't have um, on each strain. And it is it is something that is very important. Um, each strain needs to be tested individually because each strain is going to require different things. Um, you can't really say that it's safe if you're just picking and choosing one strain per field. If it has six different strains, again, they're going to all have different requirements. Um, so I, I asked the board to take another look at that and um, really kind of dial that in as far as testing each strain for pesticides for per harvest. Thanks, Riley. Tito. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm I'm definitely concerned about this reporting as well. Um, it, the reporting feels overbearing, and in the end, it feels ineffective. Um, also wondering how long the interim period is. And basically, I agree with with Silverman. Uh, I think there there just must be a way to use our POS systems to accomplish this. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Tito. Hello. Hi, Keith. Keith, it looks like you may have muted. Sorry, there I am. Yep, yeah, there you are. We hear you. I have three comments. One is to the CCB, to Mr. Byrne and Mr. Silverman about the trackages, and to Mr. Kerry Greer. Please look at metric.com, all of you. It is efficient. It is very efficient. And I will not go into details of how efficient it is because I get cut off as I normally do. My other concern is um, what are this what are the guidelines for manufacturers and do you have any guidelines for manufacturers for safety procedures in these manufacturing facilities? And are these guidelines any relation to OSHA guidelines that protect workers or Anything like that. I have not seen anything like that on the website recently. And I do applaud you for being able to open a few dispensaries in the state and you're working on some others. And I see some MSOs coming into the state as well that have worked with other companies and are expanding through the New England area. And I'm not overly concerned about them because I know they do a good job. I'm overly concerned about how come you're not addressing anything with the medical cannabis program in Vermont now that it is kind of dissolved sort of you have a staff but there's no leadership or there's nothing been discussed since those two roundtables and I feel that that needs to be addressed because that is part of your job through the legislature is to develop more better criteria for the medical cannabis community to go here or is it just going to be integrated all into the adult cannabis community and we can walk into them and use our cards and not have to pay tax on it um, I'm just curious there, and because I've heard nothing about it and seen nothing on the website, and I would really appreciate some updates or some knowledge or something you guys plan on doing, and that could be, you know, any statement. And I still would reiterate an executive report from Bryn Hare that should be telling what is going on, what your agenda is, what your future agenda is, and that should be done monthly so all the stakeholders in the state know what direction this cannabis control board is headed in. And I just, that's my comments for this week. And I thank you for trying to do what you're doing. I know it's difficult, but there are ways around and simpler ways to do some things if we hold a question and answer session from us stakeholders here in Vermont. Thank you once again. Thanks, Keith. Thanks. Jesse, Jesse Harper. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, talking on behalf of everyone who has been, had their lives thrown upside down over prohibition. And my business partner, Ben, lost his house twice, lost his job twice, in different states in this country. And somehow we don't qualify as a community 
of folks who have been you know, unfairly disadvantaged by prohibition. And I would like to comment that both myself and my business partner, Ben Jenkins, are white, about six feet tall, and are from a group who grants a lot of advantage in life. In this regard, we are all equal in the regard of people that use cannabis, that buy cannabis, that grow cannabis, that use this product. And we have all been harmed by this. And it's not about $10,000. It's about for retail application. It's about what's right. And we respectfully reject the determination by the review process as a community that has been historically disadvantaged. To be very clear, we understand that there are other communities that have been more historically disadvantaged as minority groups in this country who are the majority in the world, but in this country are the minority. And it just, I don't know what the bar is for having your life ruined a couple times to achieve this status, but it doesn't feel right at our core. And I guess that's it. Thank you for hearing us. And uh, we will be appealing this decision. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Dolan, Dolan. Dolan, Dolan, maybe Jesse Lynn? Yes, this is Jesse Lynn. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, thanks for hearing me out again today, guys. Um, I wanted to second a couple things that have been said. As far as the POS system, as a nurse in the medical system, dealing with methadone and other controlled substances that are Schedule One, the error margin is enormous. So I would also continue to reiterate what everybody has said and please look at considering using a POS system, which can not only be more efficient for those errors, but also when we think of con uh, consuming someone's time and having to pay an employee for that, I think that's a disadvantage as well. And I want to um, also thank Keith for what he had mentioned. I agree. I think it would be great if we have more of an understanding when a time frame as to some, you know, prioritization of the medical program, specifically the symptom relief oversight committee um, and how that is going to be formed and where we're at to at least maybe get the applications rolling so we know who will be on that committee come the start of January with legislative session. I think that would be very important to start working on now. Um, and lastly, I can't agree more with Riley, but I also want to throw in there as far as pesticides, we're also looking at mycotoxins. So I'm a research nurse, and one of the things I've done for seven years is do what we call side-by-sides. I run a row of one cultivar, a row of another cultivar, a row of another cultivar, or strains, if you want to use the word strains. And every year, each row absolutely has different susceptibility to mold and mildew, and that's why we run side-by-sides and do this research, and absolutely every Every strain has a very different susceptibility and possibility of mold and mildew or possibility of infestation and disease, encouraging a farmer to possibly treat each strain differently. So by testing one field as far as and the only test instead of strain by strain, I think is very um, risky and is is risking consumer protection and safety. So that's uh, that's it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jesse Lynn. Gosh. Yeah, hi, I'm just coming from a pure consumer standpoint. I've been a medical patient on and off in the program of the state for since 2013. And it's frustrating me many times, it's made me happy many times. So uh, one of the things I was excited to do is go down to College Street uh, this past weekend and see what they had available, um, especially for testing, since I've been begging them for the past eight years for individual batch testing results. And I went to the dispensary, I talked to the low level person they had me in the iPad, they sent me to the next person up that was the main iPad, and then went and talked to the manager for about 90 seconds. Came back to me and told me they don't have any certificate of analysis on site. They don't have any information for me. They asked for my email. They wrote it on a sticky note and probably tossed it away. Um, so from a consumer standpoint, that's pretty frustrating. Wondering if that's something that you guys are actually um, 
thinking about and working on just because this was a big thou who shall not be named company. But that's all my comment is. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Josh. Yari. Hello, how are you guys again? Uh, I want to thank you for all your hard work and everything that you're doing to work, you know, work towards uh, getting us uh, to a better place. Uh, I want to uh, sound out what Jesslyn said about testing. I totally agree with her about uh, how each strain is actually uh, grows differently. Hell, each plant grows differently. Uh, there is data out in California that that, that says that you that have tested two different plants from the same strain and same grown the same way, and they test differently because they draw uh, uh, nutrients the different differently. Uh, the way that California does it, they put it all in one batch 40 pound batches they mix it all up and then they send you the 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 the, the, the test the test and we grab that well they grab that they they grab they grind the whole thing up and they test it as one so it means that anything anything that 20 flowers ha had was is going to come up on that one test. but nonetheless um to treat one cultivar the same as 20 others that you're growing in the same area, it's a little bit uh, uh, unconscious, to, to say the least. Thank you very much for hearing us out. Gary? Yeah, Pepper, before this goes any further, uh, I think that's a misnomer that you wouldn't be taking a representative sample from a harvest lot. Um, we have instructions about how to sample a harvest lot in other guidance and in no way, shape or form should you sh be selecting anything other than a representative sample. And that includes a portion of each strain in the sample that gets sent to the lab. So I think um, <clears throat> that first comment led us down a road that's that wasn't necessarily accurate in, in the way things are operating. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Ross. You there, Russ? Uh, apologies. Um, hi, this is uh, Russ from series and I wanted to respond to Josh. So um, first of all, thank you for visiting us this uh, past weekend. And I'm sorry you had uh, that experience. I, I did want to confirm that all of our test results and COAs are um, not only have a QR code on everything that's sold, but you can go to our website now and see every test result we have on every product um, that we sell now. Um, it's available to anyone whether or not you purchase um, from us. So, um, so Josh, please uh, take a look um, at that. And um, if you, I'm happy to, you know, talk about that anytime offline. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Dan. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, to comment two things really quick. Uh, one, one to the person who suggested using metric. I just wanted to say that uh, metric is a really flawed and corrupted system. I really will sound in every week to not use that. I think we can all come up with something much more common sense. Um, and second, in terms of the lab testing, my opinion about the lab testing and the pesticides, like I'm, I'm a licensed cultivator. I would insist that every crop or every batch sample that I have should be tested for pesticides. And I realize that cultivators are allowed to bypass pesticide testing with a third party certification. That doesn't really make any sense to me. Most of the third party certifications are just marketing scams created by attorneys. Um, if a product is going to be consumed by humans, it should be tested for pesticides 
uh, no matter no matter how it's grown. Um, so I, I don't understand why the third party, uh, you know, certifications can have pesticide testing waived. The other thing that I thought was really strange about the way that the testing works in Vermont is in most other states. And we lost you. Um, Nelly, if Dan comes back, feel free to. Um, yep, it looks like him. actually Dan. Uh, Dan dropped off the call. He's in the lobby now. I'm readmitting him. Okay. <laughs> Dan, I believe else? you're back. Gotcha. Hey, sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure where I got cut off, but what I'll say is the last thing that I thought is strange about the testing in Vermont is that the cultivator themselves is allowed to bring it into the laboratory. <clears throat> the whole point of testing is it's supposed to be done at random. So usually you have the laboratory come and take a batch sample at random. This allows any cultivator to switch up the product or decide which specific product is going to be tested it seems more likely that the laboratory should be picking up the samples. The grower says, here's my batch, and the laboratory picks and chooses what they want at random. You know, that way it seems um, more authentic. It seems like any cultivator could just put anything they want in testing and say, this is what it is. Um, so it just seems that there's no control um, in, in that part. And I'm not sure where I got cut off, but in terms of the the pesticide testing, I, I think that any product consumed by Vermonters should be tested for pesticides, regardless of any third party um, certificate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Anyone else uh, with a comment to join via the link? Please raise your virtual hand. Chris has raised his hand. Hi there, uh, Chris Vickers. Rootland Cannabis, Tier 1 Indoor Cultivator, and I've been a caregiver for over 12 years also. I have some experience in growing and um, creating clean product for, for patients as well. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about a lot of my frustrations with things and and uh, and voiced them to you guys, and, and there's a lot of things that are still getting the kinks worked out of them. And uh, I know you guys are doing your best with a lot of this stuff. Um, as far as the testing for pesticides go, you know, that we can get clean green certified or equivalents of that, and that would give us the ability to not have that pesticide testing. And you're talking about lot batches and, and uh, having those kinds of things tested also. Maybe the best thing to do is to do spot checks on farms and having that testing done randomly so that nobody really knows when it's coming, what what plant's gonna get tested, where it's gonna get tested. I know I would contribute some money towards that kind of uh, checks and balances to keep everybody in line. Um, and if you get if you fail, if you got something on your on you found having the wrong pesticides on your crop, you're suspended, your license is pulled. I mean, that kind of threat is what's gonna prevent people from putting crap on their plants. And uh, I think that, you know, allowing batches or having to deliver certain products and having all of your stuff taken to a place where they take a sample from it, that's going to be so difficult for people to do. And it's just really not necessary. I think that, uh, you know, we should all be held accountable. And the accountability is, you know, getting checked. Um, so, yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of challenges here. I know a lot of things are still need to get worked out. I know you guys are doing your best, and uh, I couldn't be more thankful to be in a state like Vermont, where um, cottage industry businesses are putting being promoted and and uh, accepted, and and uh, you guys are doing your best to accommodate everybody. So I just want to uh, just want to thank you for that, and uh, yeah, have a great day. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, Gary, I'll uh, go back to you. Um, Chris, uh, you are in fact paying for that uh, sort of system. Um, this is a trust but verify system for consumer protection that we are building. And the recently sort of launched 
product registration system um, is going to support that uh, sampling in the field by the CCB. So basically the product registration supports the quality control and consumer protection program that just went live uh, last week. And what that program will support is field sampling products and uh, flower in the field, both the cultivators field and the retail space. Samples will be pulled off the shelf and the test that you've run yourself will be will be confirmed by the CCB. Um, we're eventually hoping to build our own lab, but in the meantime, we'll end up contracting. I think that's a piece that uh, we can take a deeper dive on later. And I know this is all spelled out in statute, but uh, we'll, as uh, the chair has said, we're sort of building the parachute as we're in free fall. But that piece has been considered and will be built. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, any other public comments? If you join via phone, you can hit star six to unmute yourself. The phone ending in 5230 has unmuted. How are you guys doing? My name Good. is uh, Zeb, Zeb Overton. Uh, I'm a grower, licensed grower. You guys licensed me in August. I'm also trying to open retail, the Green Man Cannabis, application 1294. I was just wondering if somebody could give me a call and uh, maybe give me an update on my application. That's one comment. And, uh, you know, it's just, we. I have a lot, like a lot of other people, we have a lot of things going into this, people quitting their job, you know, we're running out of money. We're ready to go. We have product tested and uh, we're ready to open the doors. We got inspected last week. And I, I just, uh, if somebody could reach out to me, it would be great. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Put me in, coach. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. Anyone else for a public comment? All right, um, I'll close the public comment window. Thanks for all the comments. Again, like, you know, when it comes to areas that people have concerns or questions, it's very helpful for the board to hear that. Um, you know, we do try and tailor our guidance documents and we do try and get back to people um, based upon these comments that we're hearing. Um, I'll just say a few things. Carrie, it sounds like maybe we should do another walkthrough of kind of testing protocols at some point soon, because it sounds like there's some confusion out there about things like representative samples and pesticide testing and potentially third-party certifications. Um, I would say that with respect to kind of the point of sale input um, directly into our inventory tracking, you know, I think a point that may have been missed is we are building that into our uh, more permanent solution. It's this interim phase um, where we don't have the ability to kind of match C CVS, CSV files with our Microsoft form. Um, and, but, you know, when this portal is, is built, um, and hopefully that is next month, uh, it will have um, those capabilities. And then the medical program, um, you know, we're our hands are a little bit tied right now. The legislation said we can't make any more restrictive rules with respect to the medical program than the ones already in place. Um, so until we change some of the statutes, um, really, there's no way to um, make the medical program look significantly different than it looks right now. Um, and so, you know, we had a number of um, you know, listening sessions around the ideas around medical. We proposed some ideas. We've been receiving public comment um, about the medical program for, um, I mean, ever since we took control over it. And um, I think that you will see legislation this year that moves that, that makes some changes to the medical program, but um, it's not something that we can do on our own um, with a kind of stroke of a pen. Um, other than that, um, Julia, Kyle, any final concluding thoughts before we adjourn? 
I just want to comment on, on the third party aspect of pesticide testing that was put in there for more of a long term view of what we're trying to accomplish here. There's been zero third parties that have been expressly authorized by the Cannabis Control Board to to certify a registered licensee um, and, and to waive pesticide testing from that third party. Um, that's something that we're looking to do potentially after we kind of filled a couple cycles to understand where where folks are and to help us, you know, release some pressure if there are bottlenecks moving forward. And I just want to remind everybody else that Carrie Jaguer, our compliance director, ran the pesticide program for the state for the better part of the last of this century. Um, everything from golf courses to the hemp program and how pesticides are applied in every way that we use them in the state of Vermont. So um, we're new to this market, but there's a lot of demonstrated experience to show how, you know, a lot of the concepts we're trying to do here um, will work in the state of Vermont context. So just just a reminder, not to toot your horn, Carrie, but it's a uh, it's important to recognize that. All right, um, I guess if there's nothing else, I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.